We're here this evening, we have the great privilege, in fact, of this event being supported by the Ursula Hoff Foundation. Graham, would you like to come up on stage, please? The Ursula Hoff Foundation has, in fact, enabled us to uh, bring two of our speakers uh, to Melbourne for the occasion. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Graham Riles, OAM, who is the uh, chairman of the Ursula Hoff Foundation, and she will, uh, he rather, will explain a little about it. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you, Susan. I'm not going to talk very long, which is good. Um, it's a pleasure for the Ursula Hoff uh, Institution Foundation to be here. We sponsor, we have two public lectures a year, and last year we started a contemporary lecture, and this year is our second contemporary lecture, and we've been very happy with working with the RMIT, and Suzanne in particular. A brief background to the Ursula Hoff Institute. Um, Ursula Hoff, the institute is obviously named after Ursula Hoff, and she was 2000, I'll start again, 1909 to 2005. She was born in London, and she was educated in Germany. Uh, she, she left Hamburg in 1933 when um, Adolf Hitler became uh, Chancellor of Germany and introduced um, anti-Jewish measures. She was brought to Australia by, university, by Women's College, which is now University College, the University of Melbourne, who wanted to um, assist a victim of fascism. And she came out, they advertised for um, a Jewish or partly Jewish refugee with a university degree who would be the college secretary. Her career encompassed art history, curatorship, and museum management at the University of Melbourne and the National Gallery of Victoria. She was lecturer in the Department of Fine Arts within the Faculty of the Arts at the University of Melbourne, as well as she worked at the National Gallery of Victoria and rose to being assistant director from 1968 to 1973. She was the last London advisor of the Felton Bequest in London from 1975 to 83. Um, she was foundation member of the fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities in 1970 and member of the Council of the National Library of Australia. Her scholarly publications include studies of Arthur Boyd, Charles Conder, John Brack, William Blake, and her major work, the standard catalogue of pre-1800 European paintings, the NGV. Dr. Hoff, as the first academic trained art historian appointed to Australian unit museum had a long distinguished and productive life as a scholar and intellectual. She was known for her independence of mind and astute judgment and set the highest standards in all areas of museum work. She established benchmarks in Australian museums to which curators and administrators continue to aspire. Established in 2003, the Ursula Hoff Institute is a charitable institution dedicated to the support of the visual arts. Inspired by the high intellectual standards of Dr. Hoff's research and scholarship, the Institute promotes and facilitates individuals and groups in the visual arts through annual and occasional lectures, scholarships, awards, and grants. Tonight's lecture is made possible by, possible by the Ursula Hoff Institute with the support of the S.R. Sturman Foundation. Thank you. Graham, thank you very much, and thank you most particularly for your generous support. <laughs> we are very grateful, thank you. Now, I basically have one further thing to do. Jackie's going to take over as moderator and, and uh, narrator, in, in, in effect, I think. But to just tell you two things. Catalogues, superb catalogues, material that we haven't that hasn't been in the public domain before, but also the opportunity to see the material in the exhibition and the material that's in the catalogues is really outstanding. And we do hope that you'll take advantage of that and that you will actually look at these catalogues. And all that takes place tonight will in fact be podcasts. So we will have, if Evelyn can nod at me, yes, it will be, on YouTube and podcast as well. So all that takes place this evening will have a life well beyond uh, the uh, walls of RMIT Story Hall. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jacqueline Healy.
First of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of this land, the Wurundjeri people. And I'd also like to, again, welcome the uh, people from Balgo and the people from Warman who are here tonight. It's, it's wonderful to have everyone here. Tonight, the, the session, we're, we're going to look at art centres. And I suppose some of you are thinking about the title, The Good, the Bad and the Ugly. Well, of course, it's a famous uh, spaghetti western uh, with Clint Eastwood. And it was a point of inspiration for um, this uh, event tonight because, in fact, what that spaghetti western was about was a treasure hunt. It's about uh, a series of people who at some points were colleagues, at other points were in direct conflict, who in fact set about a series of adventures to um, discover the treasure, the buried coins. And it is in their conflicting interests and then their joint interests and then their combined interests that the adventure uh, goes on. And I think there's a, a parallel here with the journey of art centres and the myriad interests that make up the Aboriginal art market. And so I thought I'd start uh, by talking about the good. And I'll have a personal bias in this. So I'm going to start talking about art centres, just to give a bit of an overview uh, before I hand it over to the speakers. So the art centre origin lies in the work of the church missions and in the marketing of Aboriginal artefacts and art uh, from those areas. And in some of the many well-researched reports done on this area, Urnabella has been placed uh, as, in fact, uh, the first art centre emerging in the 1940s. Art centres have, for a very long time, been the core of the Aboriginal art movement. Uh, probably one would place it since the 1970s, with the establishment of centres such as Papanya Tula, with the support from the Aboriginal Arts Board of the Australia Council. Art centres have become associated with self-determination and the cultural assertion of Indigenous uh, culture. There have been waves of creations of art centres in the early 1970s, then in the 1980s leading up to the bicentennial, and then another surge before the Olympics in Sydney. Wallagerty Artists was part of the lead up uh, to the uh, bicentennial activity and was established in 1987, and Warman followed later in 1998, part of the lead up uh, to the Olympics in 2000. My PhD actually was uh, on both Warman and Bargo in terms of the details of the emergence of these art centres, and I'll go into a bit more detail about that in a moment. But I also then wanted to quickly move on to the bad, and I just wanted to quote uh, Alison Anderson who, when she was minister in the Northern Territory government in 2011, uh, described uh, the white mafia, meaning art centre coordinators, uh, this is a direct quote from her, want us to stay uh, in misery and poverty so that we, Aboriginal artists, continue to rely on them. They are all amateurs, unemployable in Sydney or Melbourne. Nicholas Rothwell's perspective on art centres has over the years moved from uh, support to, in fact, uh, critical appraisal. And he has uh, actually blamed uh, art centres for what he considers to be a, a decline in the quality of Aboriginal art. And that the community model of running the art centre has given priority to the community as a whole rather than to the leading artists. And the leading artists have suffered accordingly. A few years ago, Jurawan was uh, put forward 
as the new model for art centres because this was a totally private sector model. Key artists, uh, major exhibitions, self-sufficient, no government funding, but Jiruwin didn't last. It folded uh, in 2010. So in fact, something that had worked very well for a very specific period of time disappeared as quickly. The other point that has been continually made in relation to the Aboriginal art market and the relation to art centres, that they've been on a trajectory of decline because of the generational change within the art centres. And it's inter interesting to note that these comments were being made <coughs> as much in the 1970s as in the 1980s, as in the 1990s, as they are now. And in that sense, what they ignore is that in fact all art movements go through generational change because in fact that is the essence of any culture and any movement. But we'll talk about that later. And finally, I just wanted to mention the ugly before I go into some of these other points in more detail, which of course must be uh, the carpetbaggers. <coughs> and in the time I've spent in working with Aboriginal art centres, which began over 15 years ago uh, in visits to Warman and Balgo and many other centres uh, in the Northern Territory and WA, is that the presence of the art, the carpetbaggers or the unscrupulous dealers have been there since the beginning. I was actually in Warman uh, in the beginning of one wet season uh, when I was filling in there when in fact carpetbaggers came into that community. And at first hand uh, I witnessed uh, that initial approach to the art centre the finding out of the key artists and the mapping out of a strategy for how to go into that community quickly, uh, get works and leave. Uh, I also followed those works uh, to a gallery in Melbourne <coughs> and mapped that out. But from the other side of things, why in fact there was an opportunity uh, for that to happen was in fact the time of year, the um, economic situation of people in that community, and it was just an aberration, not a long-term impact, but those things are still happening and happen the whole time. In Balgo recently, a senior artist was in fact taken uh, to uh, Alice Springs against her will and had to be rescued by her family, and that was just 18 months ago, and things like that are happening the whole time still. Waliyurti Artists, which is an art centre that I've mapped the history of, uh, in fact began uh, in 1987, and the current show on uh, shows the works from the 1986 exhibition that uh, inspired uh, the establishment of the art center. It also shows works from the, that were done at the adult education center that Sister Alice would talk about, which was the lead up to that exhibition. But that Waliyoti Art Center was established in 1987 and it was established with Australia Council funding. It took until 2000 for that art centre to be self-sufficient, to in fact be able to generate uh, its own wealth <coughs> and it continued to do that until uh, the recent downturn in the Aboriginal art market and then Waliyoti Artists through the guidance of the Art Centre Committee and Jimmy Chuga will talk about this later, uh, then took on the motor car project, 
which was in fact a film-based project that they did through grant money, which engaged young people in the community in making film. And they also had a touring show that went to Tokyo under that heading, The Motor Car Project, which showed the innovation that a very well-established art centre needed to undertake in the context of the changed circumstances of the art market. Now, Walla Yurti is one of a handful of art centres that have achieved uh, economic self-sufficiency. So, in fact, the backbone of the Aboriginal art market, art centres, are, in fact, subsidised businesses. And I know it's a trend to, in fact, look at subsidy and think of, a, of it negatively. But I think it might be good at this point to think of a, a very important example of subsidy, uh, which is Darwin, that uh, capital city at the north of Australia, who, in fact, um, is subsidised 90% of its activities. It generates 10% um, in revenue to subsidise the running of that area. And what comes out of Darwin in terms of benefiting Australia and, and benefiting other industries uh, is undisputable. I think in that context, one must look at the role of art centres in that broader brief of their worth and contribution to community <coughs> as well as their economic contribution and their cultural contribution. The ethical issues of the Aboriginal art market, I'm not going into detail uh, in this overview. We've recently had the Indigenous Art Code in relation to um, private art galleries. We've also had uh, royalties resale royalties introduced. We've had a lot of debate about the value of art centres. What we have is an Aboriginal art market that is a partnership between artist-run art centres, public and private art galleries, auction houses and the art buying public. And all those players have an important role to contribute. We have Eternally, since the, I think, the early 1940s, sought models to bring economic prosperity to Aboriginal communities through activities that have a cultural base. Predominantly, the need for subsidy has, in fact, prevailed. And I think it's interesting to note that the latest bevy of art centres the Indigenous Art Centre Alliance in Queensland, which was formed a, a couple of years ago, or actually it was just 2013, uh, which includes 13 art, art centres outside Cairns, is supported by the Queensland Government and is based on how art centres operate in South Australia and Western Australia. And the report that led to the establishment of this alliance was written by two ex-arts advisors who are now consultant. So the model of subsidised business continues. This market, the Aboriginal art market, is a fragile thing, but what is not fragile is the power of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural, uh, culture and art. I now have great pleasure in introducing the speakers. We're looking at two sides of things. We're beginning with the prominent art historian, uh, Ian McLean, who, uh, as we all know, is uh, a leading art historian and art critic. He's an expert in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art. He has not been involved in art uh, centres in any way, He's also confided in me uh, that he knows absolutely nothing about them. I don't think that's true. But why we've asked Ian to speak tonight 
because he's an outsider. He's viewing art centres from the outside, having not been directly involved within them. And then we have the views of key players from the Warman Art Centre and Wallyerty Artists, and they will give the insider perspective. The speakers we have here tonight, I'll just run through them. We have uh, Jimmy Chuga, who's chair of Wallyerty Artists. We have uh, Sister Ella Demp Dempsey, who established the Wiramanu Adult Education Centre at uh, Balgo and was instrumental in the beginning of the art movement there. And we also have Alan Bond, who's the current arts advisor at the, uh, I, it's Adam, sorry, at the um, Warman Art Centre. So I've, I've made him a notorious um, person when he's not. Sorry, Adam. I will now hand it over to Ian McLean, who will give his view on art centres. Thanks, Jackie. Um, I've got a bit of a cold, so I hope I get through this without getting into a coughing fit. I shouldn't really be here, but you can't say no to Jackie. <laughs> Can you, Jackie? Jackie wanted me to, to uh, sort of begin this session with a, a talk that would um, be, be, a, be a little bit controversial, I suppose, to get people thinking. So let, let's hope it does that. Um, oh, I've got to... I thought I'd better have some pictures in case you get um, bored. I'm not really talking about the Balgo Art Centre, but I thought I should begin with that. Um, <clears throat> of course, if you think um, art centres are over-subsidised by the government, you should uh, think about how much they subsidise art schools and contemporary art spaces. I'm, I, I'm sure uh, they get much greater subsidies than art centres. And uh, this is also, by the way, the sort of formal talk that the Ursula Hoff Memorial Lecture um, expects, I suppose. So I've got a talk here which I'm going to read in a formal way. Now, there's nothing in the Western art world that compares to the multiple functional space of the remote Aboriginal art centre. <clears throat> as vital to remote Aboriginal art as art schools and contemporary art spaces are to Western art, the art centre is the heart of a parallel art world that occasionally crosses with the mainstream urban art world that we're familiar with, or most of us are, as in this exhibition, or these two exhibitions on here. Without art centres and art schools, art would still have a future, but it would be a very different future driven entirely by the market. Um, uh. Now, there are <coughs> successful and acclaimed artists who don't work in an art centre or didn't go to an art school. And there's some examples here. Elmi Nangwari didn't have an art centre. Richard Bell at the top there didn't go to an art school. Michael N Nelson uh, Yagamara occasionally works at an art centre but is much better promoted by his dealer through whom, through whom he collaborates with um, Imance Tillers who, who is not an Aboriginal artist, all the other ones are, and Imance Tillers didn't go to an art school either. However, um, and I think this is an important point, the success of these artists hinges on an existing infrastructure in which art centres, contemporary art spaces and art schools are essential services. So even if you do become a very successful artist without having to use art centres or go to art schools, you still depend on this larger this sort of larger art world, or these two other art worlds. <coughs> now, while 
Um, in many respects, Aboriginal arts centres, art schools and contemporary art spaces are similar in that they sort of nur they nurture the making of art. And they're also similar, they're, they're, they're manifestations of modernity. They're, they're, they're uh, things that came about in the modern art world. Their difference, or what I've called their sort of parallel worlds, is more important. And what is interesting, I think, about uh, this painting by Jagamara and Tillers, this collaboration they did, is that this sense of a fundamental difference between remote Aboriginal art and Western art in this uh, large canvas happily coexists without the need of a resolution of any sort. It's what you might call an abiding indifference without any anxiety about identity. It's not as if these two artists felt they had to resolve the painting. They just allowed their two voices to exist together on the same canvas. <clears throat> and that's the sort of metaphor for my talk. The difference of remote Aboriginal art, that is its difference from Western art, was very much in evidence at um, Desert Mob, which I attended a few weeks ago. Desert Mob is the annual exhibition in Alice Springs in which the coordinators of the 40-odd art centres in the central and western deserts select their best work of the last year for a salon-type hang, after which a market is held in a busy annual sale. This year, Desert Mob was celebrating Des Arts' 21st birthday, its coming of age. <coughs> Images taken from Des Arts website. Des Art is the Alice Spring based umbrella organisation of these desert art centres, and Desert Mob is its open day. Thus, the best, put, the best foot is always put forward. It's time for celebration, not critique. It's aptly named One Day Symposium, and a symposium is, um, is a traditional Greek, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a Greek word, and the traditional Greek symposium was not a critical forum, but a drinking party to celebrate men coming of age and victories in sports and art contests. And this is a bit like what the symposium at um, Desert Mob is like. It's an all Aboriginal affair, except for the occasional white art coordinator who sits might, who might be sitting on the side prompting the artists. The MC um, this year was Brenda Croft and Hetty Perkins gave the keynote, respectively um, Gurunji and um, Aranda children of the stolen generation. <clears throat> In her keynote, Perkins gave a stirring sermon on the virtues of art centres and des art and the vanities of the white mainstream art world that have exploited art centres for a quick profit or for its own discourse. Things that people like myself do, the, the sort of experts. Identity, after all, is most clearly defined not through an abiding indifference, but a discourse of difference, a sort of naming of the other. And this is sort of what, what Hetty was doing. Perkins, now Perkins hesitated to damn the art world in Toto, but the message was clear. Without the art centres, the Aboriginal art movement would never have happened. Art centres don't need the art world, and the only good dealer is one who does the art centres bidding. In the other key, um, keynote address, the Wiradjuri conceptual artist Jonathan Jones gave a similar message to artists wanting to collaborate with Indigenous artists, artists like Emance Tillers, I suppose, an increasing common phenomenon these days. In short, his message was, know your place and stay there. He made a scathing remark about an unnamed white woman artist who had collaborated with an unnamed Aboriginal artist in an unnamed art centre. T together, their talk gave the sense of a strong Aboriginal nation with its own united identity and cultural expressions that the Aboriginal-owned art centres guaranteed, needing to defend itself against the outside Western art world, Western enemy, if you like, and the largely white audience clapped. Now, given the history of colonialism and also the ace that art centres hold up their sleeve, namely the art, this militant stance of Perkins and Jones is understandable and some would say necessary and even admirable. They had another point of difference to make as well. Unlike dealers and the Western art world, they said art centres are focused on the culture, not the art. And this was emphasised many times. It's in fact, well, I'll come to that in a minute. In other words, they said they are about um, sort of community 
rather than the art world. They're, it's a sort of a community art enterprise, not a fine art enterprise. So the, the global financial crash or the latest art worldism is not an art centre concern. What, ma what matters is the strength of the culture. Like an anchor driven deep into country, art centres hold the community fast, stop it being, stopping it being swept away by the wild currents of modernity that ravage these places. One frequently hears about the health and social benefits of art centres and the obverse, as we just heard tonight, that artists get pulled towards carpetbaggers and dealers because families get greedy and forget the community. So if art centres are about culture, what is culture? I thought I'd put this painting up by a, a Canadian Indigenous artist to uh, not so much answer the question, but ask the question, what is culture? These two art worlds facing each other. Now, culture, I want to um, argue, is made from processes of transculturation, a, a mixing of differences, as here. Even when one thinks in squares and the other think, thinks in circles. It's, it's, so it's made from a mixing of differences rather than, and not from some mysterious essence that um, has to be kept pure. This culture is strengthened not by building defensive walls around it, but by engaging with other cultures. The art centre is just such, the Aboriginal art centre is just such a transcultural space, though you wouldn't know it a desert mob or indeed most writing on Aboriginal art. Art centres are sites of collaboration and exchange between artists, but what makes or breaks an art centre is the collaboration, collaborative relationship developed between the artist and the art coordinator. As the broker between the artists and the wider world, the art coordinator is the linchpin of the operation. This is why art centres are so important. They are like a portal between the community and the world, looking, having to look inside and outside simultaneously. And um, some art centres are good at looking inside and some are good at looking outside, but the best are the ones that do it simultaneously. They can, they can handle the dealers and but can also um, you know, get, get the artists excited and painting at the same time. It's a very difficult thing to do. Now another um, important portal or sort of doorway between the Aboriginal art world and the, the wider art world is something more conceptual and it's to do with the way the art, the art is badged or sold, in, uh, mainly in institutional, that is, Western art world discourses. And th this is paramount, I think, to the future of both art centres and Aboriginal art. For example, when Aboriginal art is badged as primitive, as it still is in some places, as in the Musée de Quai Bronley in Paris, it effectively burns all bridges to the modern world. The, the, the portal is shut down. This is why it's rebadging from primitive art to fine art in the 1950s was such a good thing, a liberating thing. However, the rebadging wasn't that successful because in most people's mind, it simply became primitive fine art. Art galleries, which collect fine art, began establishing primitive art departments, which in the 80s morphed into Aboriginal art departments. And the story told in these Aboriginal fine art departments or primitive fine art departments remained outside the story told in the modern fine art departments. So we still had this, these sort of two worlds that weren't really talking to each other. More successful was the um, 1980s rebadging of Aboriginal art as contemporary art. This was also an institutional move, that is, it mainly happened in Western art world discourse, but art centres and artists also participated in this rebadging. Thus, when the Walpri artists made a ground painting for the Paris Festival in 1983, they said, we want to show the people of Paris that our culture is as modern as today. And Jagamara said uh, much the same thing when he painted a BMW in Walpri designs, that you can have a Walpri BMW. However, there was always at this time a competing paradigm at work. This was the badge of authenticity and Aboriginality, essential if one was to win land rights claim through making a painting. And you can see how differently a painting is hung in a land rights claim as in a contemporary art gallery. 
you wouldn't allow it to be do that in a contemporary art gallery. So it's a totally different way of badging the art. So this badge of authenticity and Aboriginality is essential if your aim is to win a land rights claim through making a painting. But it's not a very good badge if you want to sell it as contemporary art. It's also essential in activist identity politics. But notions of authenticity um, is a sort of suspect concept in the discourse of, of um, contemporary art. So these two badges, which are, which are contemporary and, or simultaneous, um, they sort of conflict with each other. So how do art centres badge Aboriginal art now? If they were badging it as modern or contemporary art in the 80s, how do they badge it now? This is the current badge of Desart taken from its website. And I'm sure we all would have heard this sort of slogan. It said a lot. Aboriginal traditional law or culture is the foundation for all the art. So what is that saying? And what, you might ask, happened to the modern or the contemporary? Where did, where did that go? Now, for a brief moment in the late 80s and early 90s, with, for example, the exhibition Balance, which was in Queensland, and the likes of artists like Gordon Bennett and Tracy Moffat, both of whom repudiated the label of authenticity and Aboriginal art for a more sort of cosmopolitan position, um, for a brief time it looked like Aboriginal art was going to go an another way completely into that direction of, um, of the contemporary. The work by Gordon Bennett. Bennett, probably the most articulate art world Aboriginal artist of his generation, rejected what he called, and this is quoting from Gordon Bennett in um, the mid-90s, what he called the grounds of any ethnic essentialism, that is, Aboriginality. What he called, and what he called it, he called the trap, what he called the trap of Aboriginality. And he said the polarisation of identity into black and white opposites. Now these ideas have not disappeared, even if you won't find them, but you won't find them on the, on the Desart website. So the point is, is that there is actually no one Aboriginal position. There are several badges in operations, several Aboriginal positions. This was even apparent at Desert Mob, despite everyone getting a prize, when Jones made the scathing remark about the unnamed art centre, which I'm now going to name. He was referring to the Ninku Centre at Kalka, which had invited the Sydney artist um, Ildiko Kovacs to work with Pitanjara artists Molly Nampajin Miller, Yarachi Connolly, and Harry Chijona. And um, I just put up that image at the top because Ildiko Kovacs had um, exhibited with um, Yubina from the Balgo Artists um, several years earlier, which is, and she sort of worked, that's why she was invited out there, I suppose. Now, <coughs> um, Jonathan Jones when he objected to this, this is the collaboration that they did down there, when he objected to the uh, collaborations that she did, that was just, just one of them, he was, um, he wasn't just speaking for himself, he was speaking for Pitanjara artists who lived further to the east, in the Jala Art Centre at Amata, who had objected to, this, to these collaborations, to, this, to um, Ildiko working with these artists. Now such dissension is normal between desert Art or in the de or b between different Aboriginal communities. Desart might like to present a common front, but the desert comprises semi-autonomous communities that not only interpret things differently, but also live with this difference. Doctrinal tensions between Eastern and Western Pitanjara recently boiled over in another project, the um, Mintaka exhibition in Adelaide, which you've probably heard about. So Aboriginal culture is a highly politicised space, mainly because there are so many transcultural tensions, transcultural both internal to Aboriginal communities, but also transcultural between Aboriginal and Western communities, and, unres and unresolved differences at work. In 1989, for example, Bumali, the um, Aboriginal Arts Cooperative established in Sydney in 1987, withdrew support from that exhibition I mentioned earlier, Balance an exhibition being organised by another Indigenous um, group called the Camp Campfire Collective in Brisbane, which included the likes of Richard Bell, who I showed you earlier. 
And they withdrew support, support because a third of the artists in balance were white artists and they didn't want to support white artists. Bumali sees itself as an urban version of a remote art centre rather than a contemporary art space in which the debates of contemporary art are not really a priority, rather that what, what is a priority is um, serving mainly New South Wales indigenous communities, in other words, culture and community rather than capital A art. By contrast, Richard Bell and his um, proper now is now the collective that they've formed since um, the Campfire Group, and his, uh, his comrade Vernon Aki oppose the traditionalism of the desert mantra, calling on artists in the desert to address contemporary issues like the intervention. They exhibit with the post-conceptual art dealer Josh Milani. Now, one way of conceptualizing this Aboriginal politics is by comparing it to another oppressed group, the Jewish people. As if the cause of their oppression was their own diasporic existence in Europe, one Jewish faction, the Zionists, sought to secure a homeland that they had left in pre-Christian times. Paradoxically, this idea of a homeland had its origin in the very ideology that in the 20th century instigated the Holocaust, namely nationalism. Now, the Zionists were not alone. Contemporary parallel discourses included black nationalism, which was, influenced, which was influential, influential on early 20th century Aboriginal activism, Pan-Africanism and the, and the Negritude movement. All these movements arose in the late 19th, early 20th century. However, there were also prominent opponents of such nationalisms. For example, the Jewish intellectuals um, such as Hannah Arendt, Theodore Dono and Walter Benjamin, all sort of art world types, opposed Zionism with what they called a diasporic cosmopolitanism. This notion of a sort of diasporic cosmopolitanism, that's the sort of badging that contemporary art uses now, the slogans of contemporary art. Similarly, uh, black critics like Edouard Glissant, Stuart Hall and Okwa Enmazor have opposed black nationalism with a, what they call a third world diasporic cosmopolitanism. And these same tensions operate in the indigenous art world. And it's, and it's not just a tension between remote and urban indigenous artists. It's a tension that you find within both of these areas. Now, while echoes of you know, what you might call Aboriginal Zionism could be heard in Australia in the early 20th century, it didn't really emerge as a political movement and ideology, the ideology of Aboriginality, until the late 1960s. And then rarely in a fully blown separatist form that you know, that it did in the, in the case of um, the Jewish case. Rather, it, it merely sought to organise Aborigines on a national level as if they were a sort of parallel nation within the Australian white nation. Its best known advocate, Charles Perkins, was nurtured in the modern Australian educational ad administrative system. It, and this gave him a view of Aborigines that was a national rather than regional view. It was a view he admitted to which his own Aranda people from which he had been taken did not subscribe. His support came, and the support that he eventually garnered around him, came from a similarly educated and emerging urban Aboriginal intelligentsia that took much of its inspiration from the black rights movement in the USA. Its moment in the sun was the Aboriginal tent embassy. At the time, um, Chicka Dixon commented, Looking back on the movement from the time when we went on the 1966 Freedom Rides, which is often seen as sort of the beginning of this uh, black nationalism or pan-Aboriginality, things have changed tremendously, he said. In those days, you could only get two blacks involved, me and Charlie. But with a lot of white students on a bus, today when you ask blacks to move, today is meaning 1972, to move on a certain issue, you can get a heap of them. So this sort of shift occurred then. The tent embassy even had its own flag. All the trappings of a nation, but without a territory or a central government or, or everything else that goes with a nation. However, its principal cause, land rights, which is territory, and self-determination, which, um, which is a sort of national idea again, meant something very different to the urban diaspora than it did to those living in remote Australia close to their country. 
such as those who formed the Papunya Tula Cooperative in the year of the Tent Embassy. The idea of an Aboriginal nation never really took hold in Australia. Ironically, the idea of Aboriginality has had a greater impact on how white Australians conceive their national identity than on orchestrating an Aboriginal nationalism. We saw that at the 2000 Olympic Games, for example, the, the opening ceremony there. So despite the flag, Aboriginal Australia is actually a much more, is much more like a cosmopolitan space, a series of localities organised in a network of relations than a nation. Now, uh, this is, art centres, um, sorry, <coughs> art centres are essential because remote life is organised differently to that of urban Australia. In urban Australia we are organised like, like a nation, a single nation. However, to strengthen culture, art centres must, uh, and I think this is true of whether you want to strengthen a national culture or you want to strengthen um, any, any culture, whether they're localised or national, to strengthen culture, art centres must engage with the wider world. If the Zionist model was close to how power was organised in the colonial era, that is, power was organised through nations, the cosmopolitan model better serves, sorry, better reflects the post-national world of globalism of today. Though this statement might strike activists who every day have to deal with the institutions of the nation state as naive. Remote Aboriginal art and the art centre model are well placed, I think, to prosper in a globalised space of the contemporary art world if the art centre envisages itself as a collaborative transcultural space in which difference is something to be translated and brokered rather than jealously guarded. Now this in fact is what's happening I think. And I don't just mean the kids are on Facebook and the artists have mobile phones. Interestingly, the opening talk at the Desert Mob Symposium concerned a collaboration between a Sydney filmmaker, Lynette Woolworth, a New York transgender singer, Anthony, who I'd never heard of before but apparently he's very well known, of Anthony and, the Johnson, Anthony and the Johnsons, and Matu artists from the Matamuli Art Centre. And it was shown at the recent Adelaide Biennale. Currently, the Italian artist Georgina Severi is doing a relational type artwork with Belgo artists for next year's Venice Biennale. So these, uh, speaking, to the art world, speaking to the outside world is going on a lot. Now this is not necessarily, sorry, there, now, there is not, this is not to say that there is a problem with the Des Art mantra, Aboriginal traditional law or culture is the foundation of all the art. The issue is not that. The issue is how this mantra is interpreted. Is tradition something behind which to retreat, as if art and tradition is there, and I'm quoting here, there to defend their children and grandchildren from the dark temptations of modernity? I'm quoting from Nicholas Rothwell, who said he was quoting from some amateur senior men, Hector Burton and people like that? Or is tradition a launching pad into the modern globalised world, which it sort of is in an artwork like this? If it is the latter, the choice is not between art centres and dealers, black and white, or the Aboriginal art world and the Western art world, or tradition and modernity. We can have both. A sister Alice Dempsey discovered with the early Balgo painters that incorporated iconography from two very different cosmological traditions, or had she already learnt this from these Kukaja men, you can hold both, you can hold both. Thank you. Can people hear me? It's on. Thanks, Ian, for a great talk and raising some great issues in relation to art centres. And now I'm going to introduce uh, Jimmy Chuga, who's the chair of Waliodi Artists. He's also an artist in his own right, and he was also with the senior men at Balgo in 1981 
when they painted the church banners for Father Peel's Silver Jubilee, uh, he was then a, a young man, and now he's a senior man. So he has seen uh, many things happen at Balgo in the art centre uh, over the years. And now he's going to talk to us about Wally Erty artists. Hello, <coughs> I'm Jimmy Chuga, the chairperson of Balgo <coughs> Wally Erty Art. Also, I'm a modern and uh, cultural man, and to the artifacts and things, everything over there. The true culture. Take them boys out, push everywhere. And also, uh, two big artifacts up at home with my son. I love what I did. I've been working for a couple of years now. And also I was the chair person when he first opened up the what I did, I was the chair person. Also, all I do is what I do. I sing with the people and and also what I do. I do a lot of art there. The last first I what do painting with the stylus and thing. I done the first painting. I'm the first man who done it with the painting on the rock. After that, I came in as a chair person, but well, I did again. So Jimmy uh, has come all the way from Balgo. He's been instrumental in the art movement there. One of the comments um, he made to me yesterday that the problem with Melbourne, there are too many white people, um, <laughs> which I just like to agree with that. <laughs> and uh, I just wondered if um, you might like to talk about what it means to the young people that art centre. Or you, you've said enough. You've no, you finished. Yeah. Finished. Well, what a great speech. Thank you so much. <laughs> well done. Thank you. And now uh, Jimmy's really introduced uh, Sister Alice for me, uh, because Sister Alice, who has come all the way from Ireland, uh, I think the journey might have been more comfortable than the the journey from Balgo, but because uh, <laughs> she had, she was driven all the way in uh, luxury air conditioning in a plane, uh, but
but she has been involved uh, with Walligerty or with Balgo <coughs> since 1981 and, I, and has had an ongoing involvement and I will just hand it over to Sister Alice to tell the story. But Jimmy has already introduced her, has been there when those Balgo banners were painted in 1981 and being there at the beginning of the coming together in a formal sense of the art movement there. Over to you. Thank you, Jackie. It's a bit daunting to be sitting up here, actually. Um, I'm delighted that Jimmy is sitting beside me to give me a bit of courage. <coughs> When I came to Balgo in 1981, I was first <coughs> working in the primary school and a young man came to help me by the name of um, Jack Amara. And he asked if we could start an adult education to uh, continue the adults' education. So <coughs> we started that and um, the people themselves marked out the place where we should go, and it was the old um, dining hall. And I remember Jimmy here was one of the people who helped in that, and we had to uh, clean it all up. And I remember Jimmy getting in the hose and um, washing down the floor, and I said to him, Jimmy, where's this water going to go? And he said, it'll go down the hole there, won't it? <laughs> so, um, so, when we had set up in a rough manner, I suppose, uh, Jimmy came one of the first days with a painting. And um, so he was the first one to introduce me to the Balgo painting. So after that, then in the end of 1981, we did set up an adult education center. We started, I hardly knew what I was doing. I was led by the people themselves. And um, at the end of that year, we had a ceremony for Father Peel. Uh, it was his uh, Silver Jubilee. And Father Peel had been working very closely with the community, uh, learning the culture and also uh, writing their language, helping them to write the language themselves. And so Father Peel was a very significant person. And we asked um, the men if they could do some art to decorate, we'll say, the church, all right, the side of the altar. And they came up, they did not know what we were asking them. I did not know what I was asking. <coughs> but they were thrown because I didn't realize that when they did their painting, it was always about their land. So I was asking them to do some for church. So they hesitated, but they came up with, with um, I think it was five beautiful paintings and they're still on show out here now. Um, but to me, that was the beginning of the, well, no, uh, people were, were drawing and painting out the desert before that. I didn't, you know, it was, uh, they transmitted their beautiful paintings onto these banners for the church. And um, that was one of the things that happened. And then after that, the young men, like Gary Nami and his family and all those um, people, um, helicopters was in at that time, and Larry and uh, Jimmy here, and they started then to do uh, banners, other banners for the church for different feast days. These banners are still preserved today. Um, <clears throat> so in a way, that was the beginning of the art movement in the adult center. We did not know where we were going. I didn't know where we were going at all. I didn't think it was happening like as the people wanted. And then we um, did up the adult center. We extended a bit. And uh, another young man came along by, can I say, can I say Matthew's name? Yeah. Uh, by the name of Matthew Gill. And Matthew said to me, just before Christmas, he said, can the, we were just going home, the extension was completed, and he said, can the, can the old men come here to do their art? 
And I said, wonderful. And that was the beginning. And so when we opened the doors, the old people came in and um, sat around. Matthew really was the advisor, because I did not know. I knew nothing about Aboriginal art. So he was the advisor. So he advised us along the way. In the beginning, we just used calico, paper, whatever we could get. And some of these paper drawings are still out there. You can see them, that they did at that time. So, um, so that was the beginning, really. I suppose, you know, of the, uh, that movement, of the movement. Yeah. And later on, that, oh yes, then in, it continued then, and more people came in to do art, and um, the women were invited in to do it. Matthew um, invited the women in, and they did their own, uh, sometimes on calico. And so um, Matthew had the great vision of having uh, an art exhibition. It was his thought, it was his vision to have that. And so in 1986, we had the first exhibition um, in Perth, the Art Gallery in Perth. And it was a great success because um, it sold, it really sold up the walls, anything that was sellable. And so that was the beginning. And then after that, um, the Arts Council, I think it was, that gave us uh, money for uh, an art manager. So then, well, it was on the way then. Okay, and, um, what did you say? Yes. So it's going strong. I mean, what has happened since then, of course, it has extended and extended. And you can see it in there, what beautiful art has been produced. And it is going strong today. And I do hope it's a real, the art center in Balgo is one of the most important places for people. And they see it as theirs. It's a community center. And they very much see it as theirs. And they have a great say in it. They have their own board of management, and I'm always very thrilled to go in there to see how it is managed, has been managed over the years. Thank you. Thank you. And for some of you in the audience might be aware of uh, Susie Butcher Butcher and Mick Gill. Matthew Gill was their son. So he was that younger generation who was actually leading um, the older people and was in fact a bridge with the art market um, in those early days in the uh, 1980s. Now I have great pleasure in introducing, uh, with the correct first name, I'm concentrating very hard, Adam Bond. Boyd. Oh, sorry. Boyd. <laughs> Did I say the wrong thing again? Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's just been a long, long day. Mm. But you know who you are. That's the most that. important thing. From Warman Arts Centre. And uh, he's going to talk about the, the Arts Centre and the great innovative things it's currently doing. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you. I w should start by uh, sending the uh, apologies of Rusty Peters and, uh, in fact, all of the artists who uh, are from Warman who came to Melbourne for the exhibition who are unable to attend tonight. Their collective age is somewhere around 240 uh, between the three of them. We don't really know, but uh, they're roughly 80 years old each. It is a huge undertaking that for them simply to travel here, let alone to um, come to an exhibition opening, to participate in a conference, to um, perform at the National Gallery of Victoria tomorrow night. Um, f by any standards, uh, I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's quite an achievement, so uh, we need to be um, um, understanding of their need to sleep, which they're doing. Um, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, uh, Warman's current traje trajectory. 
um, and to perhaps explain how we approach some of the ideas, uh, how we approach some of the problems that have been raised tonight um, earlier. For us, um, everything begins and ends with the Gidja mob. It is uh, entirely our role to facilitate what it is that they value and that the things that they want to promote within the Arts Centre and more generally through the cultural initiatives that we support. So at every turn, we consult with the Gidja mob and ask them directly, what is it that you want? What, what do you want this to look like? Where do you want it to go? So uh, we're getting better and better at doing that. We're by no means perfect. I don't think any art centre is and probably never will be. But we certainly put a lot of energy into getting the balance right and in um, um, speaking as, as plainly and as, as clearly as we can with each other. And it is very much a two-way conversation. Um, so we have a... We're, we're the success of Warman Art Centre over recent years, and, and we think we, we, we hope that this will carry us through into the future, comes from really from the artists. It, it is nothing without those artists, and it is everything because of the fabulous lineage of, of artists who lined up uh, to make it what it is. Every successive generation of artists that we support seems to um, have the same extraordinary facility for making art and telling stories that um, that have come to, um, I guess, you know, to make Warman Arts Centre what it is. Um, the current generation of senior artists are, are, are an outstanding collection of people and we're blessed to have so many of them. I think uh, their great number and as well as their skill uh, is one of the you know, most important factors behind our success because there is a great breadth and, and depth to the kinds of work that they do and the stories that they tell. We support uh, the, the work at the Arts Centre in, in, in every way that we can, um, primarily through... Um, historically, we've supported that through the support of the practice in the studios of, of, of getting people to paint, of... of preparing boards and um, uh, going out on bush trips and collecting the ochres and helping with the grinding up of the ochres, mixing them and so on. But increasingly our activities are focused on a more general form of cultural support, which I think Ian was alluding to before, which is around support for language and trips to country. Um, it's, uh, it's fair to say that one's country and one's language and one's skin lies at the heart of everything that happens within within Gidja culture. I can only speak for Gidja culture because I haven't um, had, I, well, I, I'm simply, I'm barely authorised to speak for them, let alone other Aboriginal uh, groups. But um, they are the foundations of everything that happens within the, within the art practice at the studio. I think we all share uh, a, a desire to perhaps one day to see the end of, if not the art centre, then the idea of the art centre. There's a, a kind of um, um, strangeness about the idea of an art centre which grows every day because, because of its rarefied and, and singularised position towards the production of painting. It's, it's an unsus un unsustainable idea and one that we try to turn away from wherever we can. Obviously, our success uh, is based on our ability to, to work both sides. As, as Gadia, we're there to, to uh, promote the work and to get it out to the marketplace and to protect individual artists' uh, standings within the art community. Um, but at the same time, um, it's, it's, only one of an as uh, it's only one aspect of a broad range of cultural practices which we need to value more and more. I think that it's something that uh, Australians in general need to uh, appreciate uh, as much as they are able to in the future as well, that Aboriginal culture is incredibly broad, uh, involves, um, for us, jumba or corroboree. There are um, song cycles that are sung regularly, ceremonially. Uh, the very act of hunting uh, and fishing is, uh, is a cultural pastime that connects people to their countries. It keeps the language strong. All of these pieces fit together to make 
a strong culture and primarily that is the business of the art center to keep to keep them uh, to keep supporting Gidja culture in, in whatever way that we can and 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 that's what we do for the future we're planning to uh, undertake uh, more pro uh, projects such as the one that we've put together downstairs which uh, is a an exhibition that brings together um, a more scholarly catalogue that researches the, the stories of the paintings and the paintings themselves are a telling of uh, a, 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 a well it's really a single story that crosses uh, a, a number of countries from east to west across Gidji country it's the story of course of Gankin the man who becomes the moon it's a, a complex and fascinating story about mortality of sex and death and desire um, of, of, of skin obligations it's a it's a very complex and nuanced story which we are attempting to bring to light in ways that that non-aboriginal uh, audiences non gidja audiences can understand this is a very important part of what we do is to uh, is to bridge the gap between uh, um, black fellas and white fellas and we do projects like this um, in in part to to open up those stories to wide audiences, but also to make them available to future generations of, uh, of Gidja people who will, as time goes by, become more interested in language and culture than perhaps they are today. So we will be looking at uh, a range of stories that cover a range of countries in the coming years. Um, the main idea is to get, I suppose, you know, to be completely frank, uh, is to bring a little more traction to what uh, the Gidja mob do so that uh, we can open up uh, more audiences in Australia and overseas. It'll be the, uh, an important part of our spearhead into uh, North America and to, into Europe to, um, to, I suppose, broaden the conversation and deepen the understanding. That's really what lies at the heart of it. Um, we've established in the last couple of years a media lab the idea of the Media Lab is to document uh, stories, to go out onto country with elders and younger people to uh, capture stories and also record them for future generations, to develop skill sets for younger people who are uh, having uh, as many problems as I think their parents and grandparents did straddling the two worlds. Um, but we see that the Media Lab is an important way of connecting to culture, of capturing story and giving strong vocational skills to young people who are looking for different ways to express themselves. Um, we run uh, language classes, as I said, they're a very important part of what we do at the Art Centre. But all of these things are non-core Art Centre activities. Um, it is, however, what people want, so it's what we do and at all times we uh, defer back to the Gidja mob to find out not just what they want to do but the best way to do it. That consultation person, process happens at every level. We would, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed to be sitting here actually talking like this because it is a policy of ours to uh, always have Gidja mob speaking for themselves and not have some gadia like me step in and put words into their mouths. It's always more interesting and uh, more desirable for us when one of the mob is at the microphone explaining in their own words what happens. So, so in a nutshell, that's Warman Arts Centre. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. So I, now um, I, I was going to hand it over to you. I know we're running a little bit late. I wondered if there were any questions from the audience. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we've got a microphone coming round. Hello? I just wanted to put this to the, the panel as a whole, but perhaps it was raised by Ian in terms of the way that um, he talked about the way in which Aboriginal art um, has sh shifted in terms of being, I guess, from the, the views and the in, over a temporal 
period of time and from uh, what he called primitive art or what w was generally called primitive art to contemporary art. But also, I think there's an interesting transition between when um, you see art in the community and then see it on the walls in a gallery and so forth. And there's this, and I've sort of noticed a shift in itself. And I just wanted to put to the, the panel as to whether that's something that can be seen as different or is it just simply the position of the viewer? Who would like to answer that question? Ian, would you like to have a go first? Thanks, Jackie. Um, well, you know, I, I think all art looks different in different contexts. So you walk into a, a studio down the road and look at the art there and then go and look at it, you know, whether it's Aboriginal art or Western art, you know, the, the context um, almost over-determines how you interpret the work. And once it's in the National Gallery of Victoria, well, you sort of, you start to then revere it, don't you? Just because it's in the National Gallery of Victoria. And, uh, um, and that, I think, that, that's what I was trying to get at when I talked about these badging. You know, if it's primitive art, it goes in the, in the, uh, in the museum. If it's fine art, it goes in the art gallery. So, yeah, you know, the, the, the meanings change completely as, like, in a land rights claim, how, how, you, how you see the art. So I think, that's, I think that's a normal, natural thing that I don't think you can argue against because but it's just a fact of life. But does that shift between the, I guess, what a community wants for that piece of work, let's say it's the same piece of work, and then what will operate within Western... You know, yeah, no, I mean, artists complain about this all the time, don't they? N not just Aboriginal artists, Western artists complain all the time that the, you know, the, the curator or the art critic has come in and hung their work there and made it look awful and changed, or the art critic has totally misinterpreted their work. I mean, this is sort of what happens when you move from one discourse, like the community discourse, over to the, over to another, to another discourse. So I... All these things are very real with Aboriginal art, but I think they're very real with all art. So I don't think it's something that is any different, really, you know, for, for, for any art world. They're all things that we have to, or that you have to um, deal with. I, I've just um, recently examined a, a PhD where someone did a lot of research into the um, buying patterns of Indigenous art. And one really interesting thing that came out was that um, People said, uh, 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 and, and the, this was a survey done in Alice Springs and Darwin, where people had access to art, direct access to art communities more than perhaps most people. They said, if I want to support the community, I go and buy from the art community. But if I want to get a really good artwork, I go to the dealer, because they believed that the dealer had the better quality work than the community. I thought that was sort of interesting. And I think it might be that. Perhaps the quality mightn't be different, but it might be the way the dealer frames the work compared to how it's, you know, framed in the art community. Just to add to that, uh, the banners that are in the, the current exhibition, uh, there's a comment made in the catalogue that uh, the banners were consciously painted to be hung vertically. So when the um, senior men and the senior men working with the junior men um, did those banners for Father Peel, they were conscious about how they were hung in that regard. And that was the, the first example of that, um, where people were consciously thinking about how the wall, how, how the work might be arranged on the wall. Anyone else like to make a comment? Anyone else like to make a comment on that issue? No? No. Um, okay. Mm. Any other questions? I have, um, can you hear me? I have a question for Jimmy Chuga. Um, Jimmy, how, where do you see um, your Aboriginal owned art centre? How do you see it developing in the future? What do you think? Do you want to answer that one? No, thank you. No. He 
you don't want to answer it? No. I, do you want me to give yeah, a view? Yeah. yeah. I think that um, what Jimmy has said to me before about this is he sees the art centre as something being uh, very important to the local community and very important to the, um, for culture and passing down stories and playing that role. And there's a beautiful piece uh, written by Jimmy in, in the catalogue which talks about the importance of the art centre and the importance of giving young people in Balgo uh, alternative to uh, gunja, to marijuana, and, and to um, that educational role between elders and younger people. If there are no more questions, I would just like you to join me in thanking the speakers. We're so lucky to have uh, Jimmy here from Balgo, uh, Sister Alice here from Ireland, Adam here from Warman, and Ian here from Wollongong. Um, if we could just thank them all for a very stimulating um, evening's discussion. <laughs>